In this video, we see the PN junction, which is fundamental to understand the working of very important devices like diodes and transistors. We see the physics behind the junction and the band diagram, which explains us the junction energy levels. Atom is composed by a nucleus of neutrons and protons, surrounded by electrons. Atoms are electrically neutral, so they have the same numbers of electrons and protons. Electrons cannot stay wherever, but they move in certain pathways around nucleus called orbitals. Orbitals are organized in shell and subshell. For example, the electron configuration of a neon atom is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, meaning that 1s2, 2s and 2p subshells are occupied by 2, 2 and 6 electrons respectively. This means that the outer energy level of the shell 2s and 2p are fully occupied with 8 electrons, so this element has no tendency to bond with other elements. As a matter of fact, the outer electrons are those leading the chemical property of an element, and they are called valence electrons. Orbitals have different level of energy, so we have to give energy to an electron to make it jump to an higher shell. If we give enough energy to an electron, we can make it free, so it is not bound to the atom anymore, and it is free to move. Mobile electrons are responsible of conductivity. So we have these discrete alloyed energy levels for electrons within the atom because orbitals are categorized according to its energy. But when atoms bond to form a solid, they share the valence electrons creating stable bonds. So if this is the energy level of a single atom, which is the energy level of a solid? In a solid, there are billions and billions of atoms and all those energy levels will interact and pack into one another, forming what is called bands of energy. In particular, the outer orbitals occupied by electrons form the valence band, and the other higher shells form the conduction band. In the conduction band, electrons have enough energy to be free to move. They broke somehow the crystal bond. As you can see between these bands, it can be a gap. So in order to free an electron, moving it from valence band to conduction band, we should give it some energy. The electrical property of a given material depends on the electronic population of the different allowed bands. In this way, we can catalog different behaviors of the material. For example, in metal, the valence band is closed or overlapped to the conduction band. This is because in metal, valence electrons are slightly tied to their nucleus, and the metal ions form the solid structure, leaving some electron free to move. In other words, they are in the conduction band. In insulator, the gap between valence band and conductive band is so big that we need a lot of energy to free electrons. So these materials don't carry electricity. But we have some elements which behavior is in the middle between insulators and conductors. They are called semiconductors. These elements have a little gap and at room temperature some few electrons have enough energy to jump to the conductive band. So these elements are slightly conductive and if we raise temperatures we free more electrons and we improve conductivity. These elements can behave like insulator at zero kelvins and like conductors at high temperature. These are very important elements in electronics because in proper way we can control conductivity. These orange color are the semiconductor elements. The most used is silicon. Silicon has atomic number 14 with four electrons in its outermost shell. Note other important elements we'll see later, like phosphorus, with atomic number 15, so with 5 electrons, one more than silicon, in its outermost shell, and boron, with atomic number 5 and 3 electrons on its outermost shell, one less than silicon. So silicon fills completely 1s, 2s and 2p subshell, but has 4 valence electrons in its outermost shell, the 3s and 3p, and it shares these electrons with its neighboring silicon atoms to form full orbitals of 8 electrons to reach a more stable configuration. The stable balance of attractive and repulsive forces between atoms when they share electrons is known as covalent bonding. 
in this configuration we don't have free electrons at zero kelvin but at room temperature a few electrons can have the energy to break the bonds and become free electrons however they are too few to turn the silicon in a good conductor a way to improve conductivity is doping. We put other elements into silicon crystal, for example phosphorus, having atomic number 15 and having 5 electrons in the outermost shell. In this way, we form a structure like this, where the phosphorus atom uses four valence electrons to form the covalent bond with silicon, and it donates its fifth valence electron as free charge carrier because it is not engaged in covalent bond, and it is just lightly bound to the nucleus of phosphorus, so that at room temperature it is free. Note that electrically the structure is neutral. The free electron is balanced by the phosphorus proton, so the phosphorus silicon bond is positively charged. However, if we put enough dopant, we have a lot of free electrons, thus creating the carrying particles we need for conductivity. The crystal silicon thus created is called n-type silicon because we have free electron as majority carrier. If we consider boron as dopant, we see it as atomic number 5 and three electrons in the outermost shell. In this way, we have a structure like this, where the boron atom can share just three electrons, leaving a covalent bond with a missed electron, so with a hole. This hole can be filled with other electrons coming from the silicon, and thus creating a moving hole, so a positive carrier. We have in this way a p-type material. Every portion of material is electrically neutral because we have a mobile hole and a fixed negative charge created by an electron filling the boron covalent bond. Let's see things under carrier point of view. In a silicon crystal the density is roughly 5 times 10 to the power of 22 atoms per cubic centimeter. Silicon at room temperature, 27 Celsius degree or 300 Kelvin, has some free electrons and holes where the number of holes and electrons is the same. So it has an intrinsic carrier concentration roughly of 1.08 times 10 to the power of 10 atoms per cubic centimeter. In order to create an n-type material, we put a phosphorus atom every 10 million silicon atoms, and we get a dopant density of roughly 5 times 10 to the power of 15 atoms per cc. In doing this, we have a lot of free electrons, which we can call the majority carriers, but remembering that at room temperature some silicon covalent bonds are broken, we have even some intrinsic free electrons and the same number of holes which act as minority carriers. Same situation for the p-type silicon, using boron as dopant in our case, where the majority carriers are the holes and the minority carriers are the electrons. For the sake of simplicity, we draw the silicon phosphorus bond simply with a fixed positive charge and the free electron, and we draw the silicon boron bond with a fixed negative charge and a free hole. Now we see what happens when we create a PN junction. We take an n-type material where the phosphorus silicon bond creates a fixed positive charge, which we represent with these symbols and free electrons. The phosphorus is called donor. Similarly, the p-types has fixed negative charge called acceptor and positive carriers. If we consider any portion of these crystals, they are statistically neutral. Free charges are statistically balanced by fixed ones. If we now create a PN junction, something happens. For diffusion, electrons in N type go to the closest P type area and there can be attracted by the silicon boron bond, which has a missing electron. Similarly, holes in P type go into N type. The free carriers combining with the fixed charge are trapped and a depletion area without free carriers is created. This depletion area has no carriers, but it is electrically charged because the diffusion has charged negatively the pin junction and positively the n junction. Because of this charge distribution, an electric field is formed 
creating a potential barrier which prevents free electrons in n-type to go into p-type and holes in p-type to go into n-type. In order to calculate this potential, we should first see the energy band diagram of this junction. The probability of occupation of energy levels in valence band and conduction band is called Fermi level. At absolute zero temperature, intrinsic semiconductor acts as perfect insulator. There are the zero free electrons and holes, so the probability of occupation of energy level is zero, and Fermi level is at the valence band, or the beginning of band gap. However, as the temperature increases, free electrons and holes are generated. In intrinsic semiconductor, every electron generated creates a hole, so the number of electrons in conduction band is equal to the number of holes in valence band. So the probability of occupation of energy level in conduction band and valence band are equal, and Fermi level is in the middle of forbidden gap. If we now dop semiconductor creating an n-type, so generating a loft of free electrons, we have more electrons in conduction band than holes in valence band, and the Fermi level rises toward the conduction band. On the contrary, creating a p-type material, we have more holes in valence band than electrons in conduction band, so the p-type Fermi level lowered to the valence band. Fermi level is an important reference level for us, and we know its variation related to the dopant concentration. So we draw the energy conduction and the energy valence band of the n-type and p-type materials and we remember the intrinsic sonodoping Fermi level room temperature which is in the middle of the forbidden band. But we also add the Fermi level of the p-n junction which is one and just one in thermal equilibrium. Now we should see what is the energy level in the depletion region. We remember we have a charge distribution and so an electric field E. We can apply Gauss law on the depletion surface, simplifying it in one dimension. We have this relation where rho is the charge density and epsilon is the electric permittivity. So the electric field has a linear trend first positive in the positive area of the depletion region and then negative. The potential is the electric field integral and the energy level is the potential times the charge. So we can now draw the energy level in the depletion region which has a parabolic trend with a change of sign in the middle. Now we have our energy band diagram and we can see that electrons in the n-type cannot diffuse into p-type because of the VBI or built-in potential barrier. But we know that the intrinsic Fermi level is in the middle of the gap and Fermi level of the p-n junction has to be 1 and has to be near the conduction band in the n-type and near the valence band in the p-type. Furthermore, we have formula to calculate how much Fermi level is shifted because of the doping. In the n-type, this is the formula related to the donor's concentration and in the p-type material, this is the formula related to the acceptor concentration. The sum of these two formulas is the distance between the intrinsic Fermi level in the n-type and the intrinsic Fermi level in p-type and it is geometrically equal to the VBI potential barrier. Now we have all we need to calculate the VBI or the potential barrier. We remember the dopant concentration, the intrinsic concentration, the Boltzmann constant expressed in electron volt, the room temperature expressed in kelvins, and the charge of the electron. Putting all in the formula, we get a potential of 0.67 volts. If we dop a little more the n-type only, with one phosphorus atom every million silicon atoms, we get 0.73 volt. So the barrier potential depends on the semiconductor used, on the dopant concentration, but especially on temperature, because of the linear relation. By applying a contrarian voltage to the junction, we can lower the barrier potential. Controlling barrier potential, we control PN junction conductivity, through which we can create numerous devices, among which diodes, transistors, and solar cells. Please leave me a comment and let me know if you liked this video.
make sure you put the thumb up, click the notification bell and subscribe to my channel.